Let's welcome Martin Christen. Mm. Thank you very much. Can you, can you all hear me in the back? Oh, excellent. So, and first of all, uh, thanks to the organizers, uh, Patrick, Patrick, Rebecca, and Kirsty for uh, putting together this uh, amazing conference. I mean, one of the things that shows the amazing, uh, or the absolutely fantastic organization got into it is that they actually managed to get sunshine in this part of the country, uh, which is rather unusual. And I've been here a few days now, and it's been really lovely weather. I don't know what kind of connections you have upstairs or something, but this is quite impressive. And uh, I know you will be upset if we don't get to use the rain poncho, but nonetheless, we are very happy that uh, it's been such a lovely uh, weather. Also, I think I'd like to thank the student volunteers who's done, who, who you'll see around here and who are doing a lot of work as well. So uh, thanks to them as well. And thanks for having me uh, here and coming to uh, listen to me this morning. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, some thoughts I've been making about uh, statistical learning and in particular about uh, how various uh, different approaches to statistical learning uh, might be connected up or rather perhaps should be connected up. Let me, uh, as a starting point, sort of give you a quick uh, definition or possible definition of statistical learning as essentially uncovering the structure of the input from its distributional properties. Now, if we view statistical learning in this way, it has a very long pedigree, in fact. So, uh, one of the first, if not the first, studies looking at uh, statistical learning uh, was uh, a, a paper, actually a monograph by Urban Esper from 1925. Uh, it's a language monograph from the uh, Linguistic Society of Amer America. Now, some of this work have gone uh, unnoticed in part because, you know, Esper was a behaviorist, but how, actually what he was interested in was statistical relationships between uh, various parts of input and so on in order to see what, how that can drive uh, behavior. Now, Esper was actually a true pioneer within statistical learning. I'll actually be returning to him twice uh, throughout this talk, so uh, keep uh, focused on that. Now, what this means is that statistical learning actually has a rather long pedigree uh, going back uh, nearly uh, 100 years, or actually closer to uh, 90 years. And uh, if we start with Esper, uh, a little bit later in the 1950s, we had George Miller and his project, and his project Gram Grammarama, uh, looking at, uh, again, artificial languages in order to sort of get some insight into language acquisition and language processing. And then later, of course, we have the seminal work by Arthur Reber uh, on artificial grammar learning. Then what happened was that the literature kind of split into two separate literatures, hence the uh, title of my talk. So on the one hand, uh, part of that work continued looking at uh, sort of implicit aspects of it, is basic learning and memory aspects of uh, this kind of learning. And that resulted in uh, a lot of work related to things like artificial grammar learning continued from Arthur Reber. There's also probability learning by uh, people like Donald Broadbent. Uh, there's serial reaction time uh, task uh, work by uh, individuals like um, uh, Mary Nissim, uh, Peter uh, Bulmer. Um, so we see that is one literature that sort of continue in one way. On the other hand, there's also the artificial language side of it that continued in a separate literature uh, with uh, work such as um, uh, really wonderful work by Martin Brain and Patty Brooks, who's up here somewhere, um, and also work by uh, Jim Morgan, Richard May, and Lisa Newport looking at artificial language back in the 1980s. Um, of course, um, uh, one of the things that happened in, in the sort of mid-90s was uh, the advent of uh, the paper in science by Saffron and colleagues where they uh, used babies. So this was the first time, or one of the first times, that actually very young infants was used for this kind of work. Prior to that, most of the work was with adults, except some of Patty's work that were actually with uh, children uh, as well. Now, crucially, when we look at the kind of work that was done in these two traditions, uh, on the one hand, we have our work on artificial language learning was copied, or sorry, not copied, it was published in certain kinds of journals such as uh, JML, Cognition, Cognitive Psychology, and a lot of focus of the work was on what kind of structures can be learned and so on. 
But then you had a separate literature in other journals, such as uh, JPLMC, uh, JP General, that is Journal of Experimental Psychology, and uh, Quarterly Journal of Experimental Psychology, focusing on what kind of mechanisms are involved, looking at it more closely from a memory uh, perspective. Now, uh, I think and that these two literatures are actually looking at the same thing, just from slightly different angles. And this is also something that was uh, noted by Parachet and Pactoni in that text paper from 2006, uh, where they suggested um, that really what we have here are two phenomena, uh, two approaches, but one phenomena. And uh, Chris Conway and I uh, sort of uh, labeled this uh, combined approach uh, in a paper in 2006 as implicit statistical learning. And one of the things I think are important with conferences like this, I see this conference as a way of bringing these two lines, two, these two separate lines of uh, research together again, uh, perhaps under the heading of implicit statistical learning, although it could be any other uh, kind of patterns, uh, any, kind of, any other kind of uh, heading as well, of course. But that's one uh, possible suggestion. <clears throat> now, importantly, when we are working on uh, implicit statistical learning, whether which, depending on which side of the literature uh, we are talking about, one of the things that people are trying to do is that they're exposing uh, participants to some sort of implicit material, uh, some sort of material that has some kind of statistical pattern, and they're expecting them to implicitly pick up on uh, some aspect of that stimuli. So in a sense, what people are trying to do is sort of mining the gut, so to speak, hence the, the picture here. The problem with this, of course, is that what they do when they're testing this information is essentially they want to turn that into a button press. That's what we oftentimes do, using something like a two alternative force choice uh, task. Now, there's all sort of problems with this, and there's a, uh, there was a talk by Ram Frost uh, and uh, collaborators here on uh, Saturday morning that will get into this uh, to, some, uh, to, to quite some extent. And in fact, we have a trans, uh, paper in the Royal Proceeding, uh, the transactions of the Royal Proceeding coming out discussing why this uh, is a problematic way. But I want to make a, a slightly different point that's uh, sort of building on that is that this is not a good way of trying to test uh, essentially implicit learning explicitly. Um, essentially what we're trying to do is that we're trying to get a participant to sort of <coughs> look into their gut, so to speak, and try to see what, what have they learned, and they have to translate that into a button press. It's not a direct connection, but rather what they have to do, it has to go through what we might call a consciousness filter. That I have to think about what was it as I learned, I have to choose, say, between two items, and I sort of like, ooh, what do I feel about it, and I press this button. Now, this introduces a lot of noise into the system, and this is particularly problematic if we're wanting to look at individual differences. But it's also problematic at the group level as well, because we don't have a very good measure of statistical learning in this way. So. So how can we find a better way of approaching statistical learning? How can we best capture statistical learning implicitly rather than through explicit means? Um, and one way of doing that, of course, is uh, looking at things like online uh, uh, statistical learning. And Ram will talk more about that on Saturday. I'll talk about uh, another way of thinking about it today, namely tying statistical learning more closely to basic uh, learning and memory processes. So this is a quick outline of my talk. Oh, it should be at least. Uh, apologies for that. Um, I'm first going to uh, try to convince you why we should think about uh, statistical learning essentially as a kind of chunking, uh, which allows us to, com to look at basic, memory, uh, basic uh, mechanisms of memory and learning. And then I'm going to present some data in which we test statistical learning as chunking. Um, I'm then going to go on to looking at uh, how we can use methods like that to uh, pick up uh, essentially sensitivity to patterns of statistics in the real world. So ultimately, when we are doing statistical learning, what it is we are trying to do is actually uh, have a proxy of learning about statistics in the real world. That's really what we're interested in. We don't really care about the fact that people can learn transition probabilities in the lab if, if, it, if it has no effect on behavior outside the lab. So, but it's a nice, tightly controlled uh, way of looking at it. And then, um, in the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, sort of turning uh, things on its head, uh, thinking about 
you know, when, when we do statistical learning, we oftentimes don't think about where do the statistics come from. So clearly, the statistics that are there in the patent in the world that we, we know people are sensitive to and we study in the lab and, in, and talk about in conferences like this, the statistics have to come from somewhere. And I'm going to provide some preliminary data suggested that basic uh, constraints on chunking uh, might be one way that some of these statistics may derive. Not the only source, but one of them. So what is it that we are trying to measure? And I think this is an important question, and I think it's worthwhile when we do work on statistical learning to maybe sort of step back for a minute and try to think about what is it that we are trying to do when we are studying statistical learning. Now, in general, when we as psychologists uh, approach something, um, we oftentimes will uh, sort of think a lot about various aspects of cognitions. In this case here, we're interested in statistical learning and the ability to pick up on statistical patterns. And what we do is that we come up with some idea for some task and we get very excited about it. So there's a phenomenon we want to study, statistical learning. Um, we think long and hard about it and then what we try to do is come up with a task that really will nail that down. And then what we do is that oftentimes, implicitly, not explicitly, we assume that that task actually corresponds to some mechanism in the head of somebody. Now, this is something we have to be very careful about. And let me give you an example that suggests that this is not the right way of thinking about it. And we have to be very careful about it. Now, you're probably all familiar with the task of lexical decision. Now, lexical decision is a task in which you flash something up on a screen very quickly and participants have to decide yes or no, is this a real word or not. Now, there are literally thousands of studies of statistical learning. And, and it has given us much insight into the structure of the vocabulary. It's given an insight to various kind of processes involved in reading and so on. But importantly, there is not a mechanism for, uh, for lexical decision. There's not a particular mechanism in our heads that allow us to do lexical decision. Now, it's an incredible useful task, but there's no mechanism for it. So when we're doing lexical decision, what we're doing is we're relying on patterns of information over orthography, over phonology, over semantics that come together to allow us to do responses uh, to this lexical decision task. But that's not a specific mechanism for that. So perhaps, maybe, there's not a specific mechanism or set of mechanisms for statistical learning either, but rather what we, are, what we are tapping into is a basic ability to pick up on real patterns in the world, statistical patterns in this case. So perhaps we can sort of, when thinking about what it is we're trying to study, we can think about statistical learning as a proxy for sensitivity to statistics in the real world. And here I'll be suggesting that instead of thinking of statistical learning as involving a particular mechanism or set of mechanisms, rather perhaps we should think of it as essentially tapping into basic processes of learning and memory that people have been studying for a long time, um, and that actually can give us a better handle on what the mechanisms may be. And here I'll be focused on one aspect of that, namely chunking, and in particular how chunking uh, might be viewed as statistically driven. Now, why chunking, you may be asking? Well, recently, uh, Nick Tate and I uh, had a, a BBS paper come out. It actually just came out this month, uh, or at least it was published online this month in its full uh, PDF glory, as it were. And um, one of the things that we argue in that paper is that when we are, in particular, uh, in the case of language, are processing a language input or learning from language, we're facing uh, what we call a now and ever bottleneck. Our ability to maintain information, auditory information, is incredibly short-lived. Our ability to pick up on sequences of such stuff is incredibly short-lived. On the other hand, it com language comes at it at a really rapid rate. So what we have to do, what we are suggesting is, in order to overcome this limitation, is that we engage in chunking. We essentially uh, learn to chunk the input as quickly as we can and then pass it up to a higher level of representation that buys us a little time and we enrich those representations with top-down information from uh, essentially predictions about uh, the world. Now, in other work with my graduate student, uh, Stuart McCauley, we have uh, provided some modeling that indicates that this kind of chunking, at least for the viewpoint of language acquisition, can be statistically uh, based. And 
Indeed, in the literature on statistical learning, there's already been a number of people who have suggested that chunking may be an important way of looking at statistical learning. So it's not something new uh, by any means. Uh, so, for example, a lot of work on artificial grammar learning uh, in the 1990s and uh, before focused on a number of aspects of chunking, such as the frequency of an individual chunk, uh, the frequency of chunks that occur at the beginning or the end of an item, for example, as well as the presence or absence of novel chunks. And that's something that can affect uh, people's behavior uh, in, uh, in the lab. And also there's work by um, uh, Lawrence Sloan and Scott Johnson, and there's a poster uh, that's going to be, I think, tomorrow. Uh, Lauren's going to be talking about that, where she shows that statistical learners are indeed paying attention to uh, these kind of chunks, and it seems to be not just statistics, but also chunked. And perhaps this is uh, one way of looking at it. And uh, more generally, there's, of course, have been models, uh, computational models of chunking, including, including uh, the uh, Perrichet's uh, parser, as well as other work uh, in, uh, like the one uh, the model that I've been developing with uh, Stuart uh, Macaulay. So at least some preliminary data suggests that there is some aspects of statistical learning that may be like chunking, but I'm going to try to point out there are much, many more similarities uh, here. So for example, recently there's been, a lot, there's been a fair amount of work demonstrating all sort of modality effects on statistical learning. And indeed we know from memory literature that there's also quite a lot of modality effects there as well. So for example, uh, there tend to be uh, superior auditory performance in statistical learning. We see that in uh, zero recall uh, as well. There's also differences uh, across modalities in uh, serial position curves, you know, the patterns of primacy and recency when we're trying to call information. We also see that in statistical learning. There are modality differences related to how quickly stimuli is presented in the visual versus uh, auditory modality. That's also something we see showing up both in statistical learning as well as in, uh, in uh, memory recall. And of course recently it's been suggested that there might be separate mechanisms at least to some degree uh, looking at uh, separate ways of uh, processing auditory and visual input both in statistical learning but we also know that from sort of classic memory models uh, uh, whether you like badly a hitch or not um, nonetheless there does seem to be some important differences between visual and auditory um, uh, memory recall as well. So this is one source of similarity between statistical learning and um, uh, memory come chunking. Now, there's also, also, there's also other similarities, and here again I'm going to return for the first time to uh, um, Irvin Esper. So Irvin Esper was a real, really interesting guy, he was really ahead of his time. So in another paper from 1933, he was actually one of the first people to find evidence and document evidence of individual differences in statistical learning or in artificial language learning in this case here. Now this is, you know, more than 80 years ago. So this guy was clearly ahead of his time. Um, unfortunately, he seemed, his work seemed to have gotten lost in this, in this sort of fogs of history. So uh, this paper has very few citations. Uh, it might hopefully get more citations now that people uh, come to look at it. But clearly, in the more recently, people have begun to look at individual differences in statistical learning as a way of thinking about uh, various, various ways in differences in our ability to pick up on statistical patterns might be important for understanding, for example, language learning or language processing. So we've seen uh, in uh, various work that individual differences can provide insight into statistical learning, the kind of mechanisms that may be involved, and also it correlates, for example, uh, with reading ability, with language processing ability. And of course we know from a liter literature on memory, on, on working memory, on serial recall, that um, differences in memory abilities are uh, highly correlated, again, with reading and with uh, language processing. Now, but you may be sitting here thinking, but, but hang on, hang on. Isn't recall about short-term memory? Whereas what we are trying to get at here with statistical learning is sort of longer-term uh, learning. That's a good objection. However, we also know that uh, we can look at statistical learning and they are sensitive to 
in statistical learning to, for example, orthographical regularities. And we, are, we know we can get a real world statistics to affect how people behave in our little statistical learning experiments. Um, and on the flip side, even one of the tasks that's meant to be completely experience free, namely digit recall. That's a wonderful paper that just came out uh, last year by Jones and Mackin, in which they show that actually even your ability to recall a series of random digits is affected by your experience with, the, with language in the real world. So some combination of digits are more frequent than others, and that actually affects how your ability to recall that. So again, the, the distinction between short-term and long-term memory is very much blurred, as for example has been suggested by a number of people, such as Nelson Cohen's work on, on memory. So the suggestion, at least that I take away from this, is that both statistical learning and serial recall, we might think of them uh, usefully as instances of long-term distribution learning that we are uh, looking at or focusing on in slightly different way depending on the task that we are um, involving. So just to recap here, hang on just a second, sorry. Sorry about that. To recap here, um, what I have uh, talked about here is that there are quite a lot of similarity in patterns of modality differences in both memory recall as well as statistical learning. We've seen that individual differences in memory and statistical learning are predictive of various other kinds of cognitive behavior such as reading and language, and that uh, perhaps both uh, sort of simple serial recall as well as statistical learning involve some way of tapping into long-term uh, distributional learning. But the question we might ask is, can we uh, approach statistical learning as chunking more directly? And this is something that we recently have tried to do uh, in my lab, and this is uh, work uh, uh, driven by uh, Aaron Ispelin, who's sitting up there in the back. And the way we approach this is by looking at statistical learning as essentially and fundamentally as chunking. So what we try to do is to test implicit statistical learning implicitly. And what we do is essentially we give people exposure to sort of a saffron style statistical learning task, no tiba, buba, and so on and so forth. And then they listen to that. And there's a cover task to make sure they're on task. And we can also look at changes in behavior across time. And then instead of giving them the classic two alternative first choice task afterwards, what we do instead is we give them a recall task. What we do is that we, are, we take two words that, they, um, uh, that were in the language, we combine them into sort of a, in this case, the words are uh, uh, three syllables long, so that would be a, a, a six syllable string. So they might hear something like taka lu di pa pu, um, and I apologize for my uh, bad reading of uh, this statistical material. Alan can do it much better, I promise you. Um, and then they listen to this, and then all they have to do is just recall it, like that, that disappeared quickly. And then we compare that with essentially taking the exact same syllables, but just randomizing in order to take any kind of structure out of it. And, and we do the same thing, so they listen to it, and then they're asked to recall it. In this case here, we are expecting that if they picked up on the statistical structure of what they're exposed to, they should be able to recall the six uh, syllables from that involved two words much better than the just random combination of the same syllables. And indeed, this is what we found. So we found that in terms of recall of syllables, um, they, they recall uh, significantly more syllables uh, that involved words compared to the, uh, random, the randomized control. And likewise, if we look at whether they recall the sort of a full word, again, they do that better than uh, when they're uh, randomized. Again, this shows sensitivity to the underlying pattern uh, that they were exposed to. Now importantly, this paradigm also gives you a wealth of other data that you can mine. So for example, we can look at duration and we just, really, we just got some of the data in so we haven't really looked at everything yet. But one of the things uh, we have looked at is the duration of what they do when they recall. So for example, uh, if we look at a sort of a fully correct recall string, when they involve words, you can see 
they're recalling that much faster than when they uh, fully correctly recall one that involves known words. Again, one of the things we know in general is that the more uh, we pick up on statistical patterns, the shorter they are when we produce them, for example. And we see evidence for that here, again, indicating they picked up on that. And, um, and of course, also they recall many more of these ones here than these uh, overall. So just to recap, and um, I will uh, uh, encourage you to go to Aaron's uh, poster this afternoon. Um, what we found here is that statistical learning can be measured by this simple recall measure, which is just taken from the classic memory literature, and that they show evidence of statistically defined words um, that are chunked, and we get faster recall of those words. But I mentioned earlier that one of the things that have become sort of quite important to look at in uh, statistical learning is uh, individual differences and how they might drive uh, variation in other kinds of skills. So what about individual differences? Well, here in a, a different kind of uh, but related study, we sent out to look at whether uh, we could sort of study statistical learning in the wild. That is, can we show some evidence of real world statistics uh, and may that facilitate uh, chunking and perhaps may that actually in interesting ways correlate with people's ability to process language. Now, here's uh, the part of the talk where I wanna, I'm going to try to see if you're actually awake. Um, so what I'm going to do here is do a little experiment with you here. So uh, I know it's early. Um, so here's a white screen. That's not part of the experiment as such. But what I'm going to do is to give you sort of an intuitive idea of what we are trying to get at here in this experiment is I'm going to read out aloud to you a list of letters. And then when I do this, I want you to repeat the letters back to me, right? So it's just a simple recall task, all right? Are you ready? Okay. H, C, R, L, T, I, A, P, A, C, E, A, P. <laughs> okay, all right. That's hard, right? Okay, that's 13 letters, right? So on any, any, any sort of introductory class to memory and psychology will tell you, you can't do this, right? Which you can do. So I apologize. But okay, let, me try to, let, me, let me give you an opportunity here to redeem yourselves, right? I'm also being nice to you here. So let's try this again, all right? Ready? C A T A P P L E C H A I R. Wow. What did you just do? You did chunking, right? <laughs> so you can see there's three words here. These, it's the same letters that was before, but yet someone you could do all of them. That's amazing. You guys are amazing. You redeemed yourself. Now, clearly, your ability to do this is uh, dependent on experience with language uh, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to know that CAT makes up cat and so on. Now. Let me demonstrate that in a different way. So let me do just one last uh, test here of you. Ready? E M U W O L D I M B U E. <laughs> what? You guys are falling apart here. <laughs> now, so here are the words. So these are actually also, it's the same 13 letters, but here, what you see, these are low frequency words. In fact, this particular word here, world, uh, is so low frequency that it says in the dictionary that most people don't know this word. It actually, it's another word for weld, to weld. Um, I looked that up, <laughs> I didn't know it either. Um, the point here is that our, sensi our sensitivity to an ability to use sort of real world statistics to chunk this is depending on actually experience with language. So if you hadn't come across these words, there's no way you could do it. And that's why low frequency words, it makes it harder than others. Now, what we did in this experiment, we wanted to sort of look at these kind of statistics of real world from, re from the real world language uh, in the lab in a chunking task. So it's kind of statistical learning. Now, crucially, the ability to do this, here you're chunking individual letters into word, 
uh, is something that uh, the ability to churn this kind of information in this language is something that goes beyond that also to, uh, for example, to word combinations. So uh, work in, within the user space tradition to language have shown that or have suggested that multi-word uh, combinations or multi-word chunks might be building blocks for both acquisition and processing. Um, and indeed, various kinds of studies have shown that both children and adults are sensitive to these multi-word uh, chunks and they can facilitate uh, learning. Now, if this is the case, if this is really the case that this kind of uh, information, both at the word level and at the multi-word level, that these kind of sequences, these kind of chunks are important building blocks for language, then we might expect that basic chunking ability, your ability to sort of chunk this kind of information together, statistically speaking, uh, should predict language processing skill. So that's what we tried to set out to do. So what we did, we wanted to measure individual differences in chunking ability vis-a-vis -vis actual net real world language statistics. So what we did was, so we created strings for recall tasks that were either, uh, that consisted of eight or nine uh, letters, and these were all consonants. So essentially what we're trying to look at here is statistical learning from natural language. What we did was that we analyzed, we did a corpus analysis in order to get the frequencies of bigrams or trigrams of consonants. So these are either two consecutive consonants or three consecutive uh, consonants. And then we put them together in, uh, in items, so either four bigrams into eight letters or three trigrams into nine letter strings. And of course, what we wanted to make sure is that there was no syllables here. That's why it's only consonants. And uh, they're not word-like in any way. You'll see an example. And then we manipulated the frequency uh, with which uh, these bigrams, trigrams uh, occurred in natural language. And then what we did as a control is that we took exactly the same letters but randomize them, or rather pseudo-randomize them to make sure that there's no chunk information in that. So by comparing the difference between these two, we can get an idea of how sensitive people are to these natural language statistics. So essentially what we're doing here, we're taking a very classic memory task, namely zero recall, and applying it to sort of the statistical learning of natural language uh, patterns. So here's an example of a high frequency string based on trigrams. And so people would see this on the screen, um, mask would come up and then they had to type it in. So a very simple task. Uh, here's a, a, the control string, so it's the same letters but in a different order. Um, and what we found, again, was that uh, people were, uh, oh, as you mentioned here, we have uh, percent uh, correct recall letters or, or recall, uh, correct recall chunks, that um, in the chunk uh, strings, people were significantly better at recalling those letters. Uh, and also, if we look at uh, n-gram chunks, either bigrams and trigrams, they were also significantly better at recalling those. Now, we wanted to see whether your ability to be able to recall this kind of information, can it tell us something about your ability to process language? So the idea is that if sensitivity to real-world statistical patterns is important for language processing, we want to try to demonstrate that. So what we did was that we would give these participants an online language processing task. And what we used is essentially sort of a staple of psycholinguistics, namely the, um, uh, a self-paced reading task in which individuals see uh, words one by one on the screen. And it's literally hundreds of studies that have done that. Now, as our target, um, for a variety of reasons, we use relative clauses. Um, and as I've mentioned to some people here, I've ended up doing way more work on relative clauses than I ever thought I would have to do. So, so I apologize for that. Um, bless you. Now, a relative clause, and let me for, just to quickly remind you, so here we have a subject relative clause indicated by SR. The purple line here uh, underlines the actual relative clause. And essentially, the subject, in the subject relative clause, we have the reporter who's the subject of the uh, main clause of the sentence, namely the report admitted the error, is also the subject of the relative clause. So it's the reporter that admitted the error, it's also the reporter that attacked the senator. Now we can contrast this with an object relative uh, clause sentence. And again, the object relative clause is underlined in purple. And in this case here, we still have that the reporter is the subject of the main clause, namely the report admitted the error, but this time, 
the reporter is also the object or the patient of the relative clause. So it's the senator that attacked the reporter in this case here, as indicated by the errors going in the other way. Now we know from many, many studies that object relatives of this kind here are harder to process than subject relatives. And indeed, when we looked at the reading time uh, of these data, what we have here is the sentences divided up into various regions. So we have the first part of the sentence. We have uh, either in red here, we have the subject relatives and in purple, the object relatives. So we have attacked the senator uh, here. We have attacked there, we have senator, and then we have the main verb and then the rest of the sentence. And as you can see here, people take longer uh, they are slower at processing object relatives than subject relatives, which is something that we see in many studies. That's not interesting at all, actually. Just what everybody else gets. Um, well, it's sort of interesting, but not in this context. <laughs> it's just to show you that we get the same patterns than everybody else. Now, we needed a measure of chunking ability. And what we did was that we, uh, we, we essentially uh, came up with a measure of what we call chunk sensitivity, which is essentially the uh, recall ability of an individual of experimental items minus the uh, recall of control items. And this, the idea here is that that, that uh, isolates effect of experience with multi-letter chunks as they occur statistically uh, in the language. And it controls for a variety of fact factors that might impact uh, this kind of learning, namely working memory, attention, and motivation, because the, the two contrasts are you know, exactly the same. It's the same letters, just in different orders. The only thing that's different is the statistics. So the question we asked here was, um, do chunk sensitivity correlate with online language processing? And we focused on the, uh, on here what I've, in, in the uh, interest of time, I'm going to focus on the uh, in the embedded material in the relative clause, namely what you see here on the assumption that if you're going to become good at processing relative clauses, the better you can sort of chunk together the information inside the relative clause, the easier it will be to process the sentence as a whole. And what we found when we look at the uh, reaction times uh, in, uh, across these two regions, um, we found that for subject relatives, uh, there was a significant correlation um, such that the better your chunk sensitivity, or the higher chunk sensitivi uh, sensitivity you had, the, uh, the faster you were at processing subject relatives. And we got a stronger effects in the uh, syntactically harder object relatives, as you can see here. And these results were confirmed by uh, linear mixed effects models, but I won't get into that. Now, what we also did was to divide uh, our uh, participants up into two groups using a median split into essentially good chunkers and poor chunkers. And what we see here is an interesting pattern that if you're good at chunking, then there's actually relatively little difference between uh, subject relatives and object relatives because you're really good at putting, essentially ch putting them, uh, chunking them together. Whereas if you're not so good, then we get a difference that it's the object relatives become harder. So to recap here, what we have seen in this study is that, uh, first of all, that letter recall uh, is affected by consonant chunk frequency. In the same way as I was mentioning earlier, that just simple digit re uh, recall is also affected by experience with language. So this is just at the letter level. And that chunking ability correlates with online uh, language processing. Um, and then finally, that uh, the suggestion I'd like to take away from this is that chunk-based statistical learning may facilitate complex sentence processing, but obviously there's more work to be done than this. But uh, what I want to turn to here at the end is the question of where do these statistics come from? So clearly there are statistics out there that people were sensitive to, that's what we measured, but the question is where do they come from? And here what I'll be suggesting is that Chunking may indeed be, uh, basic memory processes of chunking may be one source of these statistics. Again, not the only source. No, that all sort of things that affect the statistics of, say, patterns of words and so on. Semantics would be one of them, for example. Hopefully when people are talking, they're not just putting out distributional patterns, but they're actually trying to say something. At least that's what I've been trying to do so far in this talk. Hopefully it's working. Um, but the what I'm trying to hint at here is the possibility that chunking as a basic learning and memory mechanism might contribute to the emergence of these natural language statistics. Now, how might we test this? 
Well, here I'm going to return again for the third time to our magical uh, urban Esper. Oops. And he actually did something that, this is something I just found like literally last week that people have not discovered. So recently there's a lot of interest in uh, the illusion and language literature and what's called iterated learning. And it was thought it was something that we just came up with fairly recently, but actually Esper did this um, back in 1966. That's 50 years ago. So this is in, and, and it's not just in any journal, this is in a journal of language. Um, and what he did was, and you can see, social transmission of an artificial language. That is iterated, that's iterated learning. And he actually, uh, in this study, found uh, sort of evidence of morphological patterns emerging when you did this kind of social transmission, so, which is really cool. So again, this guy, Esper, we should pay attention to him, right? <laughs> he's Mr. Statistical Learning, and he, wa oh, he was, rather. I think he's he must be passed away. But... Um, <laughs> But moving on here, essentially the task that I'm thinking of here is a kind of a game of telephone. So it's a kind of uh, uh, experiment where you teach somebody uh, some, uh, some system and then you test them and you get whatever you get back from them, you give to the next person that comes into the lab. They're exposed to it and then you test them and you do that again and again and again until uh, you run out of money or so on. Uh, typically about, you know, say, ten, gener 10 generations. Now, the question I wanted to ask uh, with uh, colleagues from Edinburgh uh, and a former graduate student uh, was whether chunking biases might lead to the cultural evolution of structure independent of any language-like task. So many of these tasks involve some sort of communicative uh, aspect to it. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And so what we did was what we might think of as an iterated chunking uh, experiment. Um, and we had people come into the lab, uh, be set down in front of a computer, they would be exposed to blocks of 15 consonant strings. The consonant strings were about three to five characters long and they uh, drew on six different consonants. We started out with a flat distribution, meaning there is no structure in there. So the first person coming in, in, a gener in sort of the beginning of a chain, would just get sort of a flat structure. Then they would uh, be exposed to it for a little while, and then we would ask them to recall the 15 strings. Now, as you can imagine, that is not something that's easy to do. So what we asked them to do is just, just give us, please, uh, 15 strings. And they, they were willing to do that. We then took those 15 strings, and then we recoded them in, in an important way, uh, in order to use them as uh, input for the next participant. Now, this recoding was not to make any kind of tricky thing in there. Essentially, what we wanted to avoid was uh, essentially effects of where letters are on a keyboard, so there are typing, typing presence, uh, preferences and so on, so you can get patterns simply because it's easier to type certain letters than others. Um, certainly for people like me who are not very good at typing. Um, but also there could be anagrams in there. So essentially what we did is that whenever there was one letter like an X, that would be replaced for the next participant by a V, M, by T, and so on. So it's exactly the same structure in there. It just happens to be that the surface is mapping is different. So getting rid of uh, essentially typing biases, anagrams, and so on. And then we had sort of 10 participants in each chain. And what we found when we compared uh, sort of the uh, the language a person was given with what they gave us back, so we took the edit distance between the two in order to get how similar the items were to one another. What we see is that the, the, the system as a whole ends up becoming, uh, the items end up becoming more and more similar to one another. So it indicated there's some sort of recurring structure. And indeed, when we measure uh, what we might think of as distributional structure, the statistical structure of the language, what we see is that there's, that increases across time. So this is measured in terms of the frequency, the average frequency of bigrams and trigrams in the, uh, in the data. Now, of course, the important thing is, does this actually affect learning? Does this sort of more structure in there actually affect learning? And indeed it does. What you see here is the average number of correctly recalled items in the initial generation and here in the final generation. And we went from people being able to recall about four items to people being able to recall twice as many, namely eight items. So clearly the, the system of items became easier to learn. What perhaps what we have here is just that the language is sort of collapsing or the system is collapsing on itself. 
and it just had these very short items. But that's actually not the case. Here's the length of the items initially, and here it is in the final. So it's not the case that you just get very short strings. So what's going on here then? But what we get is essentially a reuse of various little chunks that increases across generations. So in order to sort of kind of bring this out, we did a sort of a network uh, analysis. Uh, we essentially connected up uh, strings to one another if they contained uh, uh, sort of common chunks. And what you see here is that when you connect it up in this way, you can see you start out with sort of very little connectivity and then you get more and more con connectivity uh, across items uh, as you go along. Um, so essentially what you see here is evidence of structural reuse, shared structure increases across generations. Now we wanted to compare this with natural language. We want to see, the, does this in some way resemble patterns we see in natural language? So in order to do that, we uh, conducted a corpus analysis um, uh, in which uh, we essentially took child-directed speech, we, we pulled out uh, uh, utterances that were three to six word long uh, from childhood. Then we took all the individual words and replaced them with parts of speech, namely things like verbs, nouns, and so on, in order to have the same number of elements as we have in, in the language. And we also had sort of roughly the same length, as in, not in the language, as in the experimental system. Now, we have baseline networks, which is essentially where you just shovel elements within strings in order to figure out what would you just get from the structure of uh, the, uh, the data. The prediction that we had was that we would see in later generations, we would say similar connectivity patterns for um, uh, uh, experimental items. And indeed, what you see here is uh, uh, our data from across generations. So red is the shuffled, uh, blue is the original data. And uh, I want to just compare, uh, sorry, I want to focus on the comparison in generation 10 with child-directed speech. And what we can see is that we actually get uh, essentially patterns that are statistically uh, indif in, indistinguishable from what we see in child directed speech. So here's generating 10, and here is child directed speech. This is length, and this is uh, structural uh, reuse. So to quickly uh, recap here, um, we see that sort of language like structure can emerge in a task that was essentially a memory task. People are told that it was a memory experiment. Um, in fact, they look, the training is what a lot of people use in artificial grammar learning. Um, and the suggestion here is that constraints on chunking amplified by cultural evolution may have shaped uh, linguistic structure uh, and that uh, more generally language might at least in part be shaped by our chunking abilities. So to quickly summarize um, uh, what I have presented here to you today is some suggestions, some uh, data suggesting that statistical learning and memory recall may involve the same underlying mechanisms, at least there's a quite substantial similarities, and that we can approach statistical learning as a kind of recall, and we, I showed you evidence from a, a task we've been developing. And then indeed, chunking uh, based on real world statistics can predict natural language processing, and that um, in order to at least provide some beginning explanation of where some of these statistics may come from, we can turn to chunking uh, that in uh, suggesting from this iterated chunking experiment that distribution patterns may derive from cultural evolution constrained by chunking. Again, not the only uh, source, of course. So to conclude, one of the things I'd like you to take away from this uh, uh, talk, uh, first of all, is that we really need to take the implicit nature of statistical learning seriously. And Ram will make this point uh, even better than me on Saturday. Uh, but importantly, not only during learning, but also during testing. We also need to be clear about what it is we're trying to measure. We need, as psychologists or psycholinguists, uh, we need to be clear about what it is we're trying to measure with our task. And we need to step back every now and then and really think about this. And then, of course, what I'm suggesting is that what we are actually uh, measuring is really uh, basic aspects of chunking and that statistical learning can be uh, integrated naturally with both basic work on learning and memory. And that statistical learning, uh, sorry, statistically based chunking may provide a way in which we can uh, unify these two literatures that I've talked about and bring them together again uh, in uh, places like this at this conference.
So with that in mind, I want to uh, acknowledge my collaborators uh, who have either helped with the data or inspired this work. So we have uh, Nick Chade at University of Warwick, Aris, Aaron Ispelin and Stuart McCauley at uh, Cornell, Evan Kidd at Australian National University, Ram Foss from Hebrew University, uh, Rick Dale from University of Merced, uh, Simon Kirby and Hannah Cornish, uh, Simon Kirby from University of Edinburgh, Hannah Cornish from uh, University of Stirling. And with that, uh, here's a picture from Williamson Park, which is a wonderful park, and with weather like this, uh, how can we not like it? So thank you very much for listening.